Author's Note and Section 1 of And Even Now. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsten Weber. And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. Author's Note. I offer here some of the essays that I have written in the course of the past ten years. While I was collecting them, and quite patiently reading them again, I found that a few of them were in direct reference to the moments at which they were severally composed. It was clear that these must have their dates affixed to them, and for sake of uniformity I have dated all the others, and, doing so, have thought i need not exclude all such topical remarks as in them too were uttered nor throw into a past tense such of those remarks as i have retained perhaps a book of essays ought to seem as if it had been written a few days before publication on the other hand but this is a note not a preface m b rapallo nineteen twenty end of author's note Section 1. A Relic, 1918. Yesterday I found in a cupboard an old, small, battered portmanteau, which, by the initials on it, I recognized as my own property. The lock appeared to have been forced. I dimly remembered having forced it myself, with a poker in my hot youth, after some journey in which I had lost the key, and this act of violence was probably the reason why the trunk had so long ago ceased to travel. I unstrapped it, not without dust. It exhaled the faint scent of its long closure. It contained a tweed suit of late Victorian pattern, some bills, some letters, a collar stud, and something which, after I had wondered for a moment or two what on earth it was, caused me suddenly to murmur down below the sea rustled to and fro over the shingle strange that these words had year after long year been existing in some obscure cell at the back of my brain forgotten but all the while existing like the trunk in that cupboard what released them what threw open the cell door was nothing but the fragment of a fan, just the butt-end of an inexpensive fan. The sticks are of white bone, clipped together with a semicircular ring that is not silver. They are neatly oval at the base, but variously jagged at the other end. The longest of them measures perhaps two inches. Ring and all, they have no market value, for a farthing is the least coin in our currency. And yet, though I had so long forgotten them, for me they are not worthless. They touch a chord. Lest this confession raise false hopes in the reader, I add that I did not know their owner. I did once see her, and in Normandy, and by moonlight, and her name was Angélique. She was graceful. She was even beautiful. I was but nineteen years old. Yet, even so, I cannot say that she impressed me favorably. I was seated at a table of a café on the terrace of a casino. I sat facing the sea with my back to the casino. I sat listening to the quiet sea, which I had crossed that morning. The hour was late. There were few people about. I heard the swing door behind me flap open, and was aware of a sharp snapping and crackling sound as a lady in white passed quickly by me. I stared at her erect, thin back and her agitated elbows. A short, fat man passed in pursuit of her, an elderly man in a black alpaca jacket that billowed. I saw that she had left a trail of little white things on the asphalt. I watched the efforts of the agonized short fat man to overtake her as she swept, wraith-like, away to the distant end of the terrace. What was the matter? 
what had made her so spectacularly angry with him the three or four waiters of the cafe were exchanging cynical smiles and shrugs as waiters will i tried to feel cynical but was thrilled with excitement with wonder and curiosity the woman out yonder had doubled on her tracks she had not slackened her furious speed but the man waddling contrived to keep pace with her now with every moment they became more distinct and the prospect that they would presently pass by me back into the casino gave me that physical tension which one feels on a wayside platform at the imminent passing of an express in the rushingly enlarged vision i had of them the wrath on the woman's face was even more saliently the main thing than i had supposed it would be that very hard parisian face must have been as white as the powder that coated it Coot, angelique gasped the perspiring bourgeois écoute je te supplie the swing door received them and was left swinging to and fro i wanted to follow but had not paid for my bock i beckoned my waiter on his way to me he stooped down and picked up something which with a smile and a shrug he laid on my table il semble que mademoiselle ne s'en servira plus this is the thing i now write of and at sight of it i understood why there had been that snapping and crackling and what the white fragments on the ground were i hurried through the rooms hoping to see a continuation of that drama a scene of appeasement perhaps or of fury still implacable but the two oddly assorted players were not performing there my waiter had told me he had not seen either of them before i suppose they had arrived that day but i was not destined to see either of them again they went away i suppose next morning jointly or singly singly i imagine they made however a prolonged stay in my young memory and would have done so even had i not had that tangible memento of them who were they these two of whom that one strange glimpse had befallen me what i wondered was the previous history of each what in particular had all that tragic pother been about mademoiselle angelique i guessed to be thirty years old her friend perhaps fifty-five each of their faces was as clear to me as in the moment of actual vision the man's fat shiny bewildered face the taut white face of the woman the hard red line of her mouth the eyes that were not flashing but positively dull with rage i presumed that the fan had been a present from him and a recent present bought perhaps that very day after their arrival in the town but what what had he done that she should break it between her hands scattering the splinters as who should sow dragon's teeth i could not believe he had done anything much amiss i imagined her grievance a trivial one but this did not make the case less engrossing again and again i would take the fan stump from my pocket examining it on the palm of my hand or between finger and thumb hoping to read the mystery it had been mixed up in so that i might reveal that mystery to the world to the world yes nothing less than that i was determined to make a story of what i had seen a conte in the manner of the great guy de maupassant now and again in the course of the past year or so it had occurred to me that i might be a writer but i had not felt the impulse to sit down and write something i did feel that impulse now it would indeed have been an irresistible impulse if i had known just what to write i felt i might know at any moment and had but to give my mind to it maupassant was an impeccable artist but i think the secret of the hold he had on the young men of my day was not so much that we discerned his cunning as that we delighted in the simplicity 
which his cunning achieved. I had read a great number of his short stories, but none that had made me feel as though I, if I were a writer, mightn't have written it myself. Maupassant had an European reputation. It was pleasing, it was soothing and gratifying to feel that one could, at any time, win an equal fame, if one chose to set pen to paper. And now, suddenly, the spring had been touched in me. The time was come. I was grateful for the fluke by which I had witnessed on the terrace that evocative scene. I looked forward to reading the manuscript of The Fan. Tomorrow, at latest. I was not wildly ambitious. I was not inordinately vain. I knew I couldn't ever, with the best will in the world, write like Mr. George Meredith. Those wondrous works of his, seething with wit, with poetry and philosophy and what not, never had beguiled me with the sense that I might do something similar. I had full consciousness of not being a philosopher, of not being a poet, and of not being a wit. Well, Maupassant was none of these things. He was just an observer, like me. Of course, he was a good deal older than I, and had observed a good deal more, but it seemed to me that he was not my superior in knowledge of life. I knew all about life, through him. Dimly, the initial paragraph of my tale floated in my mind. I, not exactly myself, but rather that impersonal je familiar to me through maupassant was to be sitting at that table with a bach before me just as i had sat four or five short sentences would give the whole scene one of these i had quite definitely composed you have already heard it down below the sea rustled to and fro over the shingle these words which pleased me much were to do double duty they were to recur they were to be by a fine stroke the very last words of my tale their tranquillity striking a sharp ironic contrast with the stress of what had just been narrated i had you see advanced further in the form of my tale than in the substance but even the form was as yet vague what exactly was to happen after mademoiselle angelique and monsieur Joumont, as I had provisionally called him, had rushed back past me into the casino. It was clear that I must hear the whole inner history, from the lips of one or the other of them. Which? Should M. Joumont stagger out onto the terrace, sit down heavily at the table next to mine, bury his head in his hands, and presently, in broken words, blurt out to me all that might be of interest? And I tell you, I gave up everything for her, everything. He stared at me with his old hopeless eyes. She is more than the fiend I have described to you. Yet I swear to you, monsieur, that if I had anything left to give, it should be hers. Down below the sea rustled to and fro over the shingle. Or should the lady herself be my informant? For a while I rather leaned to this alternative. It was more exciting. It seemed to make the writer more signally a man of the world. On the other hand, it was less simple to manage. Wronged persons might be ever so communicative, but I surmised that persons in the wrong were reticent. Mademoiselle Angélique, therefore, would have to be modified by me in appearance and behavior, toned down touched up, and poor M. Joumont must look like a man of whom one could believe anything. She ceased speaking. She gazed down at the fragments of her fan, and then, as though finding in them an image of her own life, whispered, "'To think what I once was, monsieur, what but for him I might be even now!' She buried her face in her hands, then stared out into the night. Suddenly she uttered a short, harsh laugh. Down below the sea rustled to and fro over the shingle. 
I decided that I must choose the first of these two ways. It was the less chivalrous as well as the less lurid way, but clearly it was the more artistic as well as the easier. The chose vue, the tranche de la vie, this was the thing to aim at. Honesty was the best policy. I must be nothing if not merciless. Maupassant was nothing if not merciless. He would not have spared Mademoiselle Angélique. Besides, why should I libel Monsieur Joumont? Poor, no, not poor Monsieur Joumont. I warned myself against pitying him. One touch of sentimentality and I should be lost. Monsieur Joumont was ridiculous. I must keep him so. But what was his position in life? Was he a lawyer, perhaps, or the proprietor of a shop in the Rue de Rivoli? I toyed with the possibility that he kept a fan shop, that the business had once been a prosperous one, but had gone down, down, because of his infatuation for this woman, to whom he was always giving fans, which she always smashed. Ah, monsieur, cruel and ungrateful to me, though she is, I swear to you that if I had anything left to give, it should be hers. But he stared at me with his old hopeless eyes. The fan she broke to-night was the last, the last, monsieur, of my stock. Down below. But I pulled myself together and asked pardon of my muse. It may be that I had offended her by my fooling, or it may be that she had a sisterly desire to shield Mademoiselle Angélique from my mordant art, or it may be that she was bent on saving Monsieur de Maupassant from a dangerous rivalry. Anyway, she was held from me the inspiration I had so confidently solicited. I could not think what had led up to that scene on the terrace. I tried hard and soberly. I turned the chose vue over and over in my mind, day by day, and the fan stump over and over in my hand. But the chose a figure, what, oh, what was that? Nightly I revisited the café and sat there with an open mind, a mind wide open to catch the idea that should drop into it like a ripe golden plum. The plum did not ripen. The mind remained wide open for a week or more, but nothing except that phrase about the sea rustled to and fro in it. A full quarter of a century has gone by. Monsieur Jumeau's death, so far too fat was he all those years ago, may be presumed. A temper so violent as Mademoiselle Angélique's must surely have brought its owner to the grave long since. But here all unchanged, the stump of her fan is, and once more I turn it over and over in my hand, not learning its secret, no, nor even trying to, now. The chord this relic strikes in me is not one of curiosity as to that old quarrel, but, if you will forgive me, one of tenderness for my first effort to write and for my first hopes of excellence. End of section one. Section two of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section two. How shall I word it? 1910. It would seem that I am one of those travellers for whom the railway bookstall does not cater. Whenever I start on a journey, I find that my choice lies between well-printed books, which I have no wish to read, and well-written books, which I could not read without permanent injury to my eyesight. The keeper of the bookstall, seeing me gaze vaguely along his shelves, suggests that I should take Fen Country Fanny, or else the track of blood, and have done with it. Not wishing to hurt his feelings, I refuse these works on the plea that I have read them, whereon, divining despite me that I am a superior person, says, 
here is a nice little handy edition of moore's utopia or carlyle's french revolution and again i make some excuse what pleasure could i get from trying to cope with a masterpiece printed in diminutive greyish type on a semi-transparent little greyish page i relieve the bookstall of nothing but a newspaper or two the other day however my eye and fancy were caught by a book entitled how shall i word it and sub entitled a complete letter writer for men and women i had never read one of these manuals but had often heard that there was a great and constant demand for them so i demanded this one it is no great fun in itself the writer is no fool he has evidently a natural talent for writing letters his style is for the most part discreet and easy if you were a young man writing to father of girl he wishes to marry or thanking fiance for present or reproaching fiance for being a flirt or if you were a mother asking governess her qualifications or replying to undesirable invitation for her child or indeed if you were in any other of the crises which this book is designed to alleviate you might copy out and post the specially provided letter without making yourself ridiculous in the eyes of its receiver unless of course he or she also possessed a copy of the book but well can you conceive any one copying out and posting one of these letters or even taking it as the basis for composition you cannot that shows how little you know of your fellow creatures not you nor i can plumb the abyss at the bottom of which such humility is possible nevertheless as we know by the great and constant demand there the abyss is and there multitudes are at the bottom of it let's peer down no all is darkness but faintly if we listen hard is borne up to us a sound of the scratching of innumerable pens pens whose wielders are all trying as the author of this handbook urges them to be original fresh and interesting by dint of more or less strict adherence to sample giddily you draw back from the edge of the abyss come here is a thought to steady you the mysterious great masses of helpless folk for whom how shall i word it is written are sound at heart delicate in feeling anxious to please most loath to wound for it must be presumed that the author's style of letter-writing is informed as much by a desire to give his public what it needs and will pay for as by his own beautiful nature and in the course of all the letters that he dictates you will find not one harsh word not one ignoble thought or unkind insinuation in all of them though so many are for the use of persons placed in the most trying circumstances and some of them are for persons writhing under a sense of intolerable injury sweetness and light do ever reign even yours truly jacob langton in his letter to his daughter's mercenary fiance mitigates the sternness of his tone by the remark that his task is inexpressibly painful and he mr langton is the one writer who lets the post go out on his wrath when horace masterton of thorpe road putney receives from miss jessica weir of fir villa blackheath a letter declaring her change of feelings does he upbraid her no it was honest and brave of you to write to me so straightforwardly and at the back of my mind i know you have done what is best i give you back your freedom only at your desire god bless you dear not less admirable is the behaviour in similar case of cecil grant fourteen glover street streatham suddenly as a bolt from the blue comes a letter from miss louis hawk elmview deerhurst 
breaking off her betrothal to him. Haggard, he sits down to his desk. His pen traverses the note paper. Calling down curses on Louis and on all her sex? No. One cannot say good-bye forever without deep regret to days that have been so full of happiness. I must thank you sincerely for all your great kindness to me, with every sincere wish for your future happiness. He bestows complete freedom on Miss Hawk. And do not imagine that in the matter of self-control and sympathy, of power to understand all and pardon all, the men are lagged behind by the women. Miss Layla Johnson, the manse, Carlyle, has observed in Leonard Wace, Dover Street, Saltburn, a certain coldness of demeanour. Yet, I do not blame you, it is probably your nature. And Layla, in her sweet forbearance, is typical of all the other pained women in these pages. She is but one of a crowd of heroines. Face to face with all this perfection, the not-perfect reader begins to crave some little outburst of wrath, of hatred or malice, from one of these imaginary ladies and gentlemen. He longs for, how shall he word it, a glimpse of some bad motive, of some little lapse from dignity. Often, passing by a pillar-box, I have wished I could unlock it and carry away its contents, to be studied at my leisure. I have always thought such a hall would abound in things fascinating to a student of human nature. One night, not long ago, I took a waxen impression of the lock of the pillar-box nearest to my house, and had a key made. This implement I have as yet lacked either the courage or the opportunity to use, and now I think I shall throw it away. No, I shan't. I refuse, after all, to draw my inference that the bulk of the British public writes always in the manner of this handbook. Even if they all have beautiful natures, they must sometimes be sent slightly astray by inferior impulses, just as are you and I. And, if e'er they must, surely it were well they should know how to do it correctly and forcibly. I suggest to our author that he should sprinkle his next edition with a few less righteous examples, thereby both purging his book of its monotony and somewhat justifying its subtitle. Like most people who are in the habit of writing things to be printed, I have not the knack of writing really good letters, but let me crudely indicate the sort of thing that our manual needs. Letter from Poor Man to Obtain Money from Rich One Editor's Note. The English law is particularly hard on what is called blackmail. It is therefore essential that the applicant should write nothing that might afterwards be twisted to incriminate him. End of Editor's Note. Dear Sir, Today, as I was turning out a drawer in my attic, I came across a letter which, by a curious chance, fell into my hands some years ago, and which, in the stress of grave pecuniary embarrassment, had escaped my memory. It is a letter written by yourself to a lady, and the date shows it to have been written shortly after your marriage. It is of a confidential nature, and might, I fear, if it fell into the wrong hands, be cruelly misconstrued. I would wish you to have the satisfaction of destroying it in person. At first I thought of sending it on to you by post, but I know how happy you are in your domestic life, and probably your wife and you, in your perfect mutual trust, are in the habit of opening each other's letters. Therefore, to avoid risk, I would prefer to hand the document to you personally. I will not ask you to come to my attic, where I could not offer you such hospitality as is due to a man of your wealth and position, you will be so good as to meet me at 3 a.m. sharp, tomorrow, Thursday, beside the tenth lamp post to the left on the Surrey side of Waterloo Bridge, at which hour and place we shall not be disturbed. 
I am, dear sir, yours respectfully, James Gridge. Letter from young man refusing to pay his tailor's bill. Mr. Eustace Davenant has received the half-servile, half-insolent screed, which Mr. Yardley has addressed to him, let Mr. Yardley cease from crawling on his knees and shaking his fist, Neither this posture nor this gesture can wring one bent farthing from the pockets of Mr. Davenant, who was a minor at the time when that series of ill-made suits was supplied to him, and will hereafter, as in the past, shout, without prejudice, from the housetops, that of all the tailors in London, Mr. Yardley is at once the most grasping and the least competent." Letter to thank author for inscribed copy of book. Dear Mr. Emanuel Flower, It was kind of you to think of sending me a copy of your new book. It would have been kinder still to think again and abandon that project. I am a man of gentle instincts, and do not like to tell you that a flight into Arcady, of which I have skimmed a few pages, thus wasting two or three minutes of my not altogether worthless time, is trash. On the other hand, I am determined that you shall not be able to go around boasting to your friends, if you have any, that this work was not condemned, derided, and dismissed by your sincere well-wisher, Rexford Cripps. Letter to Member of Parliament Unseated at General Election Dear Mr. Pobsby Burford, Though I am myself an ardent Tory, I cannot but rejoice in the crushing defeat you have just suffered in West Ongetown. There are moments when political conviction is overborne by personal sentiment, and this is one of them. Your loss of the seat that you held is the more striking by reason of the splendid manner in which the northern and eastern divisions of Ogetown have been wrested from the Liberal Party. The great bulk of the newspaper-reading public will be puzzled by your extinction in the midst of our party's triumph. But then, the great mass of the newspaper-reading public has not met you. I have. You will probably not remember me, you are the sort of man who would not remember anybody who might not be of some definite use to him. Such, at least, was one of the impressions you made on me when I met you last summer at a dinner given by our friends the Pelhams. Among the other things in you that struck me were the blatant pomposity of your manner, your appalling flow of cheap platitudes, and your hoggish lack of ideas." It is such men as you that lower the tone of public life, and I am sure that in writing to you thus I am but expressing what is felt, without distinction of party, by all who sat with you in the late Parliament. The one person in whose behalf I regret your withdrawal into private life is your wife, whom I had the pleasure of taking in to the aforesaid dinner. It was evident to me that she was a woman whose spirit was well-nigh broken by her conjunction with you. Such remnants of cheerfulness as were in her I attributed to the parliamentary duties which kept you out of her sight for so very many hours daily. I do not like to think of the fate to which the free and independent electors of West Ogetown have just condemned her. Only remember this— Chattel of yours, though she is, and timid and humble, she despises you in her heart. I am, dear Mr. Pobsby Burford, yours very truly, Harold Thislake. Letter from Young Lady in Answer to Invitation from Old Schoolmistress My dear Miss Price, how awfully sweet of you to ask me to stay with you for a few days but how can you think I may have forgotten you? For, of course, I think of you so very often, and of the three years I spent at your school, because it is such a joy not to be there any longer, and if one is at all down, it bucks one up directly to remember that that's all over at any rate, and that one has enough food to nourish one, and not that awful monotony of life, 
and not the petty fogging daily tyranny you went in for and i can imagine no greater thrill and luxury in a way than to come and see the whole dismal grind still going on but without me being in it but this would be rather beastly of me wouldn't it so please dear miss price don't expect me and do excuse mistakes of english composition and spelling and etc in your affectionate old pupil emily therese lynn royston p s i often write to people telling them where i was educated and highly recommending you letter in acknowledgment of wedding present dear lady amblesham who gives quickly says the old proverb gives twice for this reason i have purposely delayed writing to you lest i should appear to thank you more than once for the small cheap hideous present you sent me on the occasion of my recent wedding were you a poor woman that little bowl of ill-imitated dresden china would convict you of tastelessness merely were you a blind woman of nothing but an odious parsimony as you have normal eyesight and more than normal wealth your gift to me proclaims you at once a philistine and a miser or rather did so proclaim you until less than ten seconds after i had unpacked it from its wrappings of tissue paper i took it to the open window and had the satisfaction of seeing it shattered to atoms on the pavement but stay i perceive a possible flaw in my argument perhaps you were guided in your choice by a definite wish to insult me i am sure on reflection that this was so i shall not forget yours etc cynthia beaumarsh p s my husband asks me to tell you to warn lord amblesham to keep out of his way or to assume some disguise so complete that he will not be recognized by him and horsewhipped p p s i am sending copies of this letter to the principal london and provincial newspapers letter from but enough i never thought i should be so strong in this line i had not foreseen such copiousness and fatal fluency never again will i tap these deep dark reservoirs in a character that had always seemed to me on the whole so amiable End of section two Section three of And Even Now by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section three Mobbled King, nineteen eleven. Just as a memorial, just to perpetuate in one's mind the dead man in whose image and honor it has been erected, this statue is better than any that I have seen no pedantic reader i ought not to have said than any other that i have seen except in shrouded and distorted outline i have not seen this statue not as an image then can it be extolled by me and i am bound to say that even as an honour it seems to me more than dubious commissioned and designed and chiselled and set up in all reverence it yet serves very well the purpose of a guy this does not surprise you you are familiar with a host of statues that are open to precisely that objection westminster abbey abounds in them they confront you throughout london and the provinces they stud the continent rare indeed is the statue that can please the well-wishers of the person portrayed nor in every case is the sculptor to blame there is in the art of sculpture itself a quality intractable to the aims of personal portraiture sculpture just as it cannot fitly record the gesture of a moment is discommoded by personal idiosyncrasies the details that go to compose this or that gentleman's appearance such as the little wrinkles around his eyes and the way his hair grows and the special convolutions of his ears all these presentable on canvas or evocable by words 
are not right matter for the chisel or for the mould and furnace translated into terms of bronze or marble howsoever cunningly these slight and trivial things cease to be trivial and slight they assume a ludicrous importance no man is worthy to be reproduced as bust or statue and if sculpture is too august to deal with what a man has received from his maker how much less ought it to be bothered about what he has received from his hosier and tailor sculpture's province is the soul the most concrete it is also the most spiritual of the arts the very heaviness and stubbornness of its material precluding it from happy dalliance with us fleeting individual creatures fit it to cope with that which in mankind is permanent and universal it can through the symbol give us incomparably the type wise is the sculptor who when portray an individual he must treats arbitrarily the mere actual husk and strives but to show the soul of course he must first catch that soul what m rodin knew about the character and career of mr george wyndham or about the character and career of mr bernard shaw was not a hazard worth knowing and mr shaw is handed down by him to posterity as a sort of bearded lady and mr wyndham as a sort of beardless one but about honore de balzac he knew much balzac he understood balzac's work balzac's soul in that great rugged figure aspiring and indeflexible he gave us with a finality that could have been achieved through no other art than sculpture there is a close kinship between that statue of balzac and this statue of which i am telling you both induce above all a profound sense of unrest of heroic will to overcome all obstacles the will to compass self-expression the will to emerge from darkness to light from formlessness to form from nothing to everything this it is that i find in either statue and this it is in virtue of which the balzac has unbeknown a brother on the italian seaboard here stands or rather struggles on his pedestal this younger brother in strange contrast with the scenery about him mildly behind his back the sea laps the shingle mildly in front of him on the other side of the road rise some of those mountains whereby the earth before she settled down to cool compassed she too some sort of self-expression mildly around his pedestal among rusty anchors strewn there on the grass between road and beach sit the fishermen mending their nets or their sails or whittling bits of wood what will you say of these fishermen when but i outstrip my narrative i had no inkling of tragedy when i first came to the statue i did not even know it was a statue i had made by night the short journey from genoa to this place beside the sea and driving along the coast road to the hotel that had been recommended i passed what in the starlight looked like nothing but an elderly woman mounted on a square pedestal and gazing out seaward a stout elderly lonely woman in a poke bonnet indescribable except by that old victorian term a party and as unlike balzac's younger brother as only sarah gamp's elder sister could be how i wondered in my hotel came the elder sister of sarah gamp to be here in liguria and in the twentieth century how clomb she puffing and panting on to that pedestal for what argosy of gin was she straining her old eyes seaward i knew there would be no sleep for me until i had solved these problems and i went forth afoot along the way i had come the moon had risen and presently i saw in the starlight the party who so intrigued me eminent amorphous mysterious there she stood immobile voluminous 
ghastly beneath the moon. By a slight shoreward lift of crinoline, as against the seaward protrusion of poke bonnet, a grotesque balance was given to the unshapely shape of her. For all her uncanniness, I thought I had never seen any one, male or female, old or young, look so hopelessly common. I felt that by daylight a noble vulgarity might be hers. In the watches of the night she was hopelessly, she was transcendentally common. Little by little, as I came nearer, she ceased to elude me, and I began to think of her as it. What it was, however, I knew not, until I was at quite close quarters to the pedestal it rose from. There, on the polished granite, was carved this legend. A Umberto Io. And instinctively, as my eye travelled up, my hand leapt to the salute, for I stood before the veiled image of a dead king, and had been guilty of a misconception that dishonoured him. Standing respectfully at one angle and another, I was able to form, by the outlines of the grey sheeting that enveloped him, some rough notion of his posture and his costume. Round what was evidently his neck, the sheeting was constricted by ropes, and the height and girth of the bundle above, to half-closed eyes even now an averted poke-bonnet, gave token of a tall helmet with a luxuriant shock of plumes waving out behind. Immediately beneath the ropes, the breadth and sharpness of the bundle hinted at epaulettes, and the protrusion that had seemed to be that of wind-blown crinoline was caused, I thought, by the king having his left hand thrust well out to grasp the hilt of his inclined sword. Altogether I had soon builded a clear enough idea of his aspect, and I promised myself a curious gratification in comparing, anon, this idea with his aspect as it really was. Yes, I took it for granted that the expectant statue was to be unveiled within the next few days. I was glad to be in time, not knowing in how terribly good time I was for the ceremony. Not since my early childhood had I seen the unveiling of a statue, and on that occasion I had struck a discordant note by weeping bitterly. I dare say you know that statue of William Harvey which stands on the Lees at Folkestone? You say you were present at the unveiling? Well, I was the child who cried. I had been told that William Harvey was a great and good man who discovered the circulation of the blood and my mind had leapt, in all the swiftness of its immaturity, to the conclusion that his statue would be a bright blood red. Cruel was the thrill of dismay I had, when at length the cord was pulled and the sheeting slid down, revealing so dull a sight. Contemplating the veiled Umberto, I remembered that sight, remembered those tears, unworthy, as my nurse told me, of a little gentleman, Years had passed. I was grown older and wiser. I had learned to expect less of life. There was no fear that I should disgrace myself in the matter of Umberto. I was not so old, though, nor so wise, as I am now. I expected more than there is of Italian speed, and less than there is of Italian subtlety. A whole year has passed since I first set eyes on veiled Umberto, and Umberto is still veiled, and veiled for more than a whole year, as I now know, had Umberto been before my coming. Four years before that, the municipal council, it seems, had voted the money for him. His father, of sensational memory, was here already, in the main piazza, of course, and Garibaldi was hard by. So was Mazzini, so was Cavour. Umberto was still implicit in a block of marble high upon one of the mountains of Carrara. The task of educing him was given to a promising young sculptor who lived here. Down came the block of marble and was transported to the studio of the promising young sculptor, and out, briskly enough, mustachios and all, came Umberto. He looked very regal, I am sure, 
as he stood glaring around with his prominent marble eyeballs, and snuffling the good fresh air of the world, as far as might be into shallow marble nostrils, he looked very authoritative and fierce and solemn, I am sure. He made, anyhow, a deep impression on the mayor and the councillors, and the only question was as to just where he should be erected. The granite pedestal had already been hewn and graven, but a worthy sight was to seek. Outside the railway station? He would obstruct the cabs. In the Giardino Pubblico? He would clash with Garibaldi. Every councillor had a pet sight, and every other one a pet objection to it. That strip of waste ground where the fishermen sat pottering? It was too humble, too far from the centre of things. Meanwhile, Umberto stayed in the studio. Dust settled on his epaulets. A year went by. Spiders ventured to spin their webs from his plumes to his mustachios. Another year went by. Whenever the councillors had nothing else to talk about, they talked about the site for Umberto. Presently they became aware that among the poorer classes of the town had arisen a certain hostility to the statue. The councillors suspected that the priesthood had been at work. The forces of reaction against the forces of progress. Very well. The councillors hurriedly decided that the best site available, on the whole, was that strip of waste ground where the fishermen sat pottering. The pedestal was promptly planted, Umberto was promptly wrapped up, put on a lorry, wheeled to the place, and hoisted into position. The date of the unveiling was fixed. The mayor, I am told, had already composed his speech, and was getting it by heart. Around the pedestal the fishermen sat pottering. It was not observed that they received any visits from the priests. But priests are subtle, and it is a fact that three days before the date of the unveiling, the fishermen went, all in their black Sunday clothes, and claimed audience of the mayor. He laid aside the manuscript of his speech and received them affably. Old Agostino, their spokesman, he whose face is so marvelously wrinkled, lifted his quavering voice. He told the mayor, with great respect, that the rights of the fishermen had been violated. That piece of ground had, for hundreds of years, belonged to them. They had not been consulted about that statue. They did not want it there. It was in the way, and must, said Agostino, be removed. At first the mayor was inclined to treat the deputation with a light good humor, and to resume the study of his manuscript. But Agostino had a manuscript of his own. This was a copy of a charter whereby, before mayors and councillors were, the right to that piece of land had been granted in perpetuity to the fisherfolk of the district. The mayor, not committing himself to any opinion of the validity of the document, said that he, but there, it is tedious to report the speeches of mayors. Agostino told his mayor that a certain great lawyer would be arriving from Genoa tomorrow. It were tedious to report what passed between that great lawyer and the mayor and the councillors assembled. Suffice it that the councillors were frightened. The date of the unveiling was postponed, and the whole matter, referred to higher authorities in Rome, went darkly drifting into some form of litigation, and there abides. Technically, then, neither side may claim that it has won. The statue has not been unveiled, but the statue has not been displaced. Practically, though, and morally, the palm is so far to the fishermen. The pedestal does not really irk them at all. On the contrary, it and the sheeting do cast for them in the heat a pleasant shadow, of which the influence of Fleet Street once felt never shaken off forces me to say they are not slow to avail themselves. And the cost of the litigation comes not, you may be sure, out of their light old pockets, but out of the coffers of some pious rich folk hereabouts. 
the pope remains a prisoner in the vatican well here is umberto a kind of hostage yet with what a difference here is no spiritual king stripped of earthly kingship here is an earthly king kept swaddled up day after day to be publicly ridiculous the fishermen as i have said pay him no heed the mare passing along the road looks straight in front of him with an elaborate assumption of unconcern so do the councillors but there are others who look maliciously up at the hapless figure now and again there comes a monk from the monastery on that hill yonder he laughs into his beard as he goes by two by two in their grey cloaks and their blue mantillas the little orphan girls are sometimes marched past there they go as i write not malice but a vague horror is in the eyes they turn umberto belike is used as a means to frighten them when or lest they offend the nun in whose charge they are crosses herself yet it is recorded of umberto that he was kind to little children this indeed is one of the few things recorded of him fierce though he looked he was for the most part it must be confessed null he seldom asserted himself there was so little of that for him to assert he had therefore no personal enemies in a negative way he was popular and was positively popular for a while after his assassination and this it is that makes him now the less able poor fellow to understand and endure the shame he is put to stat rex indignatus he does try to assert himself now does strive by day and night poor petrifact to rip off these fell and clownish integuments of his elder brother in paris he has never heard but he knows that lazarus arisen from the tomb did not live in grave clothes he forgets that after all he is only a statue to himself he is still a king or at least a man who was once a king and having done no wrong ought not now to be insulted if he had in his composition one marble grain of humour he might but no a joke against oneself is always cryptic fat men are not always the best drivers of fat oxen and cryptic statues cannot be depended on to see cryptic jokes if umberto could grasp the truth that no man is worthy to be reproduced as a statue if he could understand once and for all that the unveiling of him were itself a notable disservice to him then might his wrath be turned to acquiescence and his acquiescence to gratitude and he be quite happy hid is he really more ridiculous now than he always was if you be an extraordinary man as was his father win a throne by all means you will fill it if your son be another extraordinary man he will fill it when his turn comes but if that son be as alas he most probably will be like umberto quite ordinary then let parental love triumph over pride of dynasty advise your boy to abdicate at the earliest possible moment a great king what better but it is ill that a throne be sat on by one whose legs dangle uncertainly towards the dais and ill that a crown settle down over the tip of the nose and the very fact that for quite inadequate kings men's hands do leap to the salute instinctively does but make us on reflection the more conscious of the whole absurdity even than a great man on a throne we can when we reflect imagine something ah uh, not something better perhaps but something more remote from absurdity let us say that umberto's father was great as well as extraordinary he was accounted great enough to be the incarnation of a great idea united italy oh yes a great idea a charming idea in the sixties i should have been all for it but how shall i or any other impartial person write odes to the reality 
what people in all this exquisite peninsula are today the happier for the things done by and through Vittorio Emanuele Liberator? The question is not merely rhetorical. There is the large class of politicians who would have had no scope in the old days, and there are the many men who, in other days, would have been fishing or ploughing, but now strut in this and that official uniform. There passes between me and the sea as I write, how opportunely people do pass here, a little man with a peaked cap and light blue breeches, and a sword. His prime duty is to see that none of his fellow peasants shall carry home a bucket of sea water, for there is salt in sea water, and heavily, because they must have it or sicken, salt is taxed and this passing sentinel is to prevent them from cheating the revenue by recourse to the sea which though here it is they must not regard as theirs what becomes of the tax money it goes towards the building of battleships cruisers gunboats and so forth what are these for why for italy to be a great european power with of course in the little blue bay behind Umberto, while I write, there lies at anchor an Italian gunboat. Opportunely again, I can but assure you that it is really and truly there. It has been there for two days. It delights the fishermen. They say it is bella e pulita come un fiore. They stand shading their eyes towards it, smiling and proud, heirs of all the ages neglecting their sails and nets and spars of wood they can imagine nothing better than it they see nothing at all sinister or absurd about it these simple fellows and simple umberto their captive strives to wheel round on his pedestal and to tear but a peephole in his sheeting he would be glad could he feast but one eye on this bit of national glory but he remains helpless, helpless as a sultana made ready for the Bosphorus, helpless as a pig is in a poke. It enrages him that he, who was so eminently respectable in life, should be made so ludicrous on his eminence after death. He is bitter at the inertia of the men who set him up. Were he an ornament of the church, not of the state that he served so conscientiously, how very different would be the treatment of his plight if he were a saint occluded thus by the municipality how many the prayers that would be muttered the candles promised for his release there would be processions too and who knows but that there might even be a miracle vouchsafed a rending of the veil the only procession that passes him is that of the intimidated orphans no heavenly power intervenes for him perhaps he bitterly conjectures for fear of offending the vatican scirocco now and again blows furiously at his back but never splits the sheeting rain often soaks it never rots it there is no help for him he stands a mock to the pious a shame and incubus to the emancipated received yet hushed up, exalted yet made a fool of, taken and left, a monument to fate's malice. From under the hem of his weather-beaten domino, always he just displays, with a sort of tragic coquetry, the toe of a stout and serviceable marble boot. And this, I have begun to believe, is all that I shall ever see of him else might I not be writing about him, for else had he not so haunted me. If I knew myself destined to see him, to see him steadily and see him whole, no matter how many years hence, I could forthwith think about other things. I had hoped that by this essay I might rid my mind of him. He is inexcutable, confound him, his pedestal draws me to itself with some such fascination as had the altar of the unknown god for the wandering Greek. 
I try to distract myself by thinking of other images. Images that I have seen. I think of Bartolomeo Colleoni riding greatly forth under the shadow of the Church of St. John and St. Paul. Of Mr. Peabody, I think, cosy in his armchair behind the Royal Exchange. Of Nelson above the sparrows, and of Perseus among the pigeons. Of Golden Albert, and of Harvey, the knot red. Up looms Umberto, uncouthly casting them one and all into the shade. I think of other statues that I have not seen, statues suspected of holding something back from even the clearest-eyed men who have stood beholding and soliciting them. But how obvious, beside Umberto, the Sphinx would be, and Memnon, how tamely he sits waiting for the dawn. Matchless as a memorial, then, I say again, this statue is, and as a work of art it has at least the advantage of being beyond criticism. In my young days I wrote a plea that all the statues in the streets and squares of London should be extirpated and, according to their materials, smashed or melted. From an aesthetic standpoint I went a trifle too far, London has a few good statues. From an humane standpoint, my plea was all wrong. Let no violence be done to the effigies of the dead. There is disrespect in setting up a dead man's effigy and then not unveiling it. But there would be no disrespect, and there would be no violence, if the bad statues familiar to London were ceremoniously veiled and their inscribed pedestals left just as they are. That is a scheme which occurred to me soon after I saw the veiled Umberto. Mr. Birrell has now stepped in and forestalled my advocacy. Pereant qui. But no, who could wish that charming man to perish? The realization of that scheme is what matters. Let an inventory be taken of those statues, let it be submitted to Lord Rosebery, and he be asked to tick off all those statesmen, poets, philosophers, and other personages about whom he would wish to orate. Then let the list be passed on to other orators, until every statue on it shall have its particular spokesman. Then let the dates for the various veilings be appointed. If there be four or five veilings a week, I conceive that the whole list will be exhausted in two years or so, and my enjoyment of the reported speeches will not be the less keen because I can so well imagine them. In conclusion, Lord Rosebery said that the keynote to the character of the man in whose honour they were gathered together today was, first and last, integrity applause. He did not say of him that he had been infallible, which of us was infallible, laughter, but this he would say, that the great man whose statue they were looking on for the last time had been actuated throughout his career by no motive but the desire to do that, and that only, which would conduce to the honour and to the stability of the country that gave him birth. Of him it might truly be said, as has been said of another, that which he had to give, he gave. Long and prolonged applause. His lordship then pulled the cord, and the sheeting rolled up into position. Not, however, because those speeches will so edify and soothe me, nor merely because those veiled statues will make less uncouth the city I was born in, do I feverishly thrust onto you my proposition. The wish in me is that posterity shall be haunted by our dead heroes, even as I am by Umberto. Rather hard on posterity? Well, the prevision of its plight would cheer me in mine immensely. End of section three. Section four of And Even Now. 
by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 4. Kolnyach, 1913. None of us who keep an eye on the heavens of European literature can forget the emotion that we felt when, but a few years since, the red star of Kolnyach swam into our ken. As nobody can prove that I wasn't, I claim now that I was the first to gauge the magnitude of this star, and to predict the ascendant course which it has in fact triumphantly taken. That was in the days when Kolnyach was still alive. His recent death gives the cue for the boom. Out of that boom, I, for one, will not be left. I rush to scrawl my name, large, on the tombstone of Kolnyach. These foreign fellows always are especially to be commended. By the mere mention of their names, you evoke in the reader or hearer a vague sense of your superiority and his. Thank heaven we are no longer insular. I don't say we have no native talent. We have heaps of it, pyramids of it, all around. But where, for the genuine thrill, would England be, but for her good fortune in being able to draw on a seemingly inexhaustible supply of anguished souls from the continent? Infantile, wide-eyed Slavs, Titan Teutons, greatly blighted Scandinavians, all of them different, but all of them raving in one common darkness, and with one common gesture plucking out their vitals for exportation. There is no doubt that our continuous receipt of this commodity has had a bracing effect on our national character. We used to be rather phlegmatic, used we not? We have learnt to be vibrant. Of Kolnyach, as of all authentic master spirits in literature, it is true that he must be judged rather by what he wrote than by what he was. But the quality of his genius, albeit nothing if not national and also universal, is at the same time so deeply personal that we cannot afford to close our eyes on his life, a life happily not void of those sensational details which are what we really care about. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. Kolnyach was born, last of a long line of rag-pickers, in 1886. At the age of nine, he had already acquired that passionate alcoholism, which was to have so great an influence in the moulding of his character and on the trend of his thought. Otherwise, he does not seem to have shown in childhood any exceptional promise. It was not before his eighteenth birthday that he murdered his grandmother and was sent to that asylum in which he wrote the poems and plays belonging to what we now call his earlier manner. In 1907, he escaped from his sanctum, or chutzcheck, cell, as he sardonically called it, and, having acquired some money by an act of violence, gave, by sailing for America, early proof that his genius was of the kind that crosses frontiers and seas. Unfortunately, it was not of the kind that passes Ellis Island. America, to her lasting shame, turned him back. Early in 1908, we find him once more in his old quarters, working at those novels and confessions on which, in the opinion of some, his fame will ultimately rest. Alas, we don't find him there now. It will be a fortnight ago tomorrow that Luntik Kolnyach passed peacefully away in the twenty-eighth year of his age. He would have been the last to wish us to indulge in any sickly sentimentality. Nothing is here for tears, nothing but well and fair and what may quiet us in a death so noble. Was Kolnyach mad? It depends on what we mean by that word. If we mean, as the bureaucrats of Ellis Island, and, to their lasting shame, his friends and relatives, presumably meant, 
that he did not share our own smug and timid philosophy of life, then, indeed, Kolniach was not sane. Granting, for sake of argument, that he was mad in a wider sense than that, we do but oppose an insuperable stumbling-block to the eugenists. Imagine what Europe would be today had Kolniach not been. As one of his critics avers, It is hardly too much to say that a time may not be far distant, and may indeed be nearer than many of us suppose, when Luntik Kolniach will, rightly or wrongly, be reckoned by some of us as not the least of those writers who are especially symptomatic of the early twentieth century and are possibly for all time or for a more or less certainly not inconsiderable period of time that is finely said but i myself go somewhat further I say that Kolniach's message has drowned all previous messages and will drown any that may be uttered in the remotest future. You ask me what precisely that message was? Well, it is too elemental, too near to the very heart of naked nature for exact definition. Can you describe the message of an angry python more satisfactorily than as or that of an infuriated bull better than as that of Kolniach lies somewhere between these two. Indeed, at whatever point we take him, we find him hard to fit into any single category. Was he a realist or a romantic? He was neither, and he was both. By more than one critic, he has been called a pessimist, and it is true that a part of his achievement may be gauged by the lengths to which he carried pessimism, railing and raging, not in the manner of his tame forerunners, merely at things in general, or at women, or at himself, but lavishing an equally fierce scorn and hatred on children, on trees and flowers and the moon and, indeed, on everything that the sentimentalists have endeavoured to force him to favour. On the other hand, his burning faith in a personal devil, his frank delight in earthquakes and pestilences, and his belief that every one but himself will be brought back to life in time to be frozen to death in the next glacial epoch, seem rather to stamp him as an optimist. By birth and training a man of the people, he was yet an aristocrat to the fingertips, and Byron would have called him brother, though one trembles to think what he would have called Byron. First and last, he was an artist, and it is by reason of his technical mastery that he most of all outstands. Whether in prose or in verse, he compasses a broken rhythm that is as the very rhythm of life itself, and a cadence that catches you by the throat as a terrier catches a rat and wrings from you the last drop of pity and awe. His skill in avoiding the inevitable word is simply miraculous. He is the despair of the translator. Far be it from me to belittle the devoted labours of Mr. and Mrs. Pegaway, whose monumental translation of the master's complete works is now drawing to its splendid close. Their promised biography of the murdered grandmother is awaited eagerly by all who take, and which of us does not take, a breathless interest in Kolniachana. But Mr. and Mrs. Pegaway would be the first to admit that their renderings of the prose and verse they love so well are a wretched substitute for the real thing. I wanted to get the job myself, but they nipped in and got it before me. Thank heaven they cannot deprive me of the power to read Kolniach in the original Dibrich, and to crow over you, who can't. Of the man himself, for on several occasions I had the privilege 
and the permit to visit him, I have the pleasantest, most sacred memories. His was a wonderfully vivid and intense personality. The head was beautiful, perfectly conic in form. The eyes were like two revolving lamps set very close together. The smile was haunting. There was a touch of old-world courtesy in the repression of the evident impulse to spring at one's throat. The voice had notes that recalled M. Mounet-Suisse in the later and more important passages of Oedipe Roy. I remember that he always spoke with the greatest contempt of Mr. and Mrs. Pegaway's translations. He likened them to... But enough. His boom is not yet at the full. A few weeks hence I shall be able to command an even higher price than I could now for my talks with Kolnyach. End of section 4